Good evening. Welcome to Free Speech and the Danish Cartoons, a panel discussion. My name is Jason Hoskin. I'm the president and founder of the USC Objectivist Club. <clears throat> the USC Objectivist Club is a university student organization whose purpose is the study of objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, author of Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. This event would not have been possible without the dedication of the Ayn Rand Institute. It has been a consistent source of financial, moral, and logistical support uh, for this event. We'd also like to thank Professor James Moore from Social Policy and Planning and Development for his financial support, as well as his help in publicizing this event. Uh, we'd also like to thank our esteemed panelists and moderator for agree agreeing to participate in tonight's event. For those interested uh, in the club and in objectivism, uh, there is information uh, at the table in the lobby for you to take as, as you'd like. Uh, if you value tonight's event and look forward to more of this, these events in the future, uh, you might consider becoming a financial supporter of the club. Donations will be accepted at the information table in the lobby. And also, you can uh, make a donation via our website, www.uscobjectivistclub.com, which has a PayPal uh, button where you can make donations electronically. Uh, before I turn the mic microphone over to our moderator for this event, uh, who will then introduce the panelists and give some background information about this event, I'd like to remind you all of our standards for audience participation this evening. This is a panel discussion, which includes the opportunity for audience questions and answers. Uh, we are here for a respectful, rigorous, and passionate intellectual discourse. If you want to disrupt or inter interrupt the proceedings or are here to protest, uh, security will be es escorting you out of the building. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. Our moderator for, for this evening is Dr. Edwin Locke. Dr. Locke is uh, Dean's Professor Emeritus of Leadership and Motivation at the University of Maryland. He has published more than 230 articles, uh, chapters, and books on subjects such as leadership, work motivation, goal setting, job satisfaction, incentives, and the philosophy of science. He is internationally known for his work on human motivation He's the author of such books as The Prime Movers, Traits of the Great Wealth Creators. And now, without further ado, Dr. Edwin Locke. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's panel discussion, Unveiling the Danish Cartoons, a Discussion of Free Speech and World Reaction. Last fall, on September 30th, the Danish newspaper Jelens Posten published 12 cartoons depicting Mohammed. The cartoons were commissioned to illustrate an article in Freedom of Speech and were on the climate of fear of criticizing Islam that has been growing among European intellectuals. Apparently, that, peer, that fear was well-founded. The cartoons sparked a firestorm of controversy that has reached a climax in recent months. The Islamic world erupted into violent protest with rioters setting fire to the Danish embassies in Syria and Lebanon. Death threats and widespread calls to inflict violence on the cartoonist have sent them into hiding for fear of their lives. Some of the cartoons that generated this response will be on display this evening shortly. In America, the right to free speech is protected by the First Amendment to our Constitution, which reads as follows, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances." End of quote. Similar protections of freedom of speech exist in virtually all Western countries. Issues to be addressed tonight will include, what is freedom of speech? Does it include the right to offend? What is the significance of the worldwide Islamic reaction to the cartoons? How should Western governments have responded to this incident? How should the Western media have responded? Let me now introduce our panelists for tonight. 
On my right, Dr. Daniel Pipes is director of the Middle East Forum. He taught world history at the University of Chicago, 1978 to 82, history at Harvard University, 1983 and 84, and policy strategy at the Naval War College, 1984 to 86. He worked on the policy planning staff at the State Department in 1983 and was director of a Philadelphia think tank called the Foreign Policy Research Institute for seven years before starting the Middle East Forum in 1994. Dr. Pipes is the author of 12 books, plus numerous newspaper columns and a weblog. He is a columnist for the New York Sun, and he appears weekly in Israel's Jerusalem Post, Italy's La Pinione, Spain's La Raison, and monthly in the Australian and Canada's Globe and Mail. His website, danielpipes.org, is the single most access internet source of specialized information on the Middle East and Islam. Mr. Pipes has appeared on ABC World News, CBS Reports, Crossfire, Good Morning America, News Hour with Jim Lehrer, Nightline, The O'Reilly Factor, The Today Show, BBC, and Al Jazeera. On my left, the other panelist, Dr. Yaron Brook, is president and executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute. As a recognized expert on objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, he's interviewed extensively by the print, radio, and television media for the objectivist position on current events and issues, such as the war in Iraq, internet control, and censorship, threats to freedom of speech, and other issues. His recent media appearances include TV interviews on Closing Bell and the O'Reilly Factor. Dr. Brooks' previous service in the Israeli Army Intelligence and years of extensive research have given him an expertise on the Middle East conflict and American foreign policy in that region. Universities con and community groups around the country have hosted his most recent speeches on the situation in the Middle East, which include talks on the moral case for supporting Israel and why America is losing the war on terror. So we'll now pause while the cartoons are put up. What I was going to say. Um, here's how tonight's format will go. Um, there will be an opening statement by Dr. Pipes for 10 minutes, uh, an opening statement by Dr. Brooke for 10 minutes, and I will pose five questions to the two panelists, and they will have, depending on how it's been pre-organized, between two and four minutes to respond to the question. When those questions are completed, we will have both written and oral questions from the audience. And I'll give the rules for that after we finish the main program. So to start the evening off, uh, Dr. Pipes will now give his um, opening statement. We will have a gentleman, if you'd hold up, give you the two-minute sign and the 30-second sign. Thank you, Dr. Locke, for the kind introduction. I thank uh, Jason Hoskin and the Objectivist Club for hosting us, the Ayn Rand Institute for taking the initiative, and the University of South Southern California for allowing us use of its facilities and protecting us. I think it's important to be here, and I'll explain why in the next few minutes. The issue at hand, I believe, ultimately, is not really about freedom of speech. The issue could well have been something else, or the specific could well have been something else. The issue ultimately here is whether we in the United States are going to live under some form of Sharia law or not. Whether Islamic law will decide what we do or not. The instance in this case happens to be cartoons of Muhammad, but it could well have had to do with other issues. For example, concerning the status of women, concerning uh, halal food, concerning many other points. 
The key issue is whether we in the United States are willing to allow an imp the imposition of a alien legal code on ourselves. Are we going to give a special privilege to Islam such as it has in Muslim majority countries? Or is, is Islam going to join the other religions in the United States in the free-for-all, in the marketplace of ideas, in the critique and the uh, positive and negative discussion that comes with that? Uh, we are used to, in this country, having a freedom of speech concerning religion. We're used to giving no religion special status. Islam historically has had a special status in countries where it predominates. And the impetus, the historic impetus of Islam is to expand and to win such special rights elsewhere. That is at base what's at issue here. The first time the Islamic world, in some fashion, tried to control the debate or the discussion in the West occurred 17 years earlier, when in February of 1989, the Ayatollah Khomeini, ruler of Iran, sent out an edict in which he condemned Salman Rushdie for publishing a novel, The Satanic Verses, in London, in which he made fun of Muhammad. And at that point, Khomeini said, you may not do this. He indicated that the laws that apply in Iran apply also in England. The issue at that time was uh, rather similar to this one, and it became clear to Westerners that if you speak in a less than complimentary way about Muhammad, you will be penalized. This was round two. Some cartoonists did draw cartoons that were less than complimentary, and they were penalized. Which brings me to my second point. Um, the traction of these ideas depends very much, not s very much on the left in our societies. Where the left ignores and repudiates the position of radical Islam, you find that the Islamists are very weak and apologetic. For example, just two weeks ago, there was the story of an Afghan, Muslim born, who converted to Christianity. He was in judgment and on his way to execution for the audacity to leave Islam and join Christianity. When the outside world got wind of this, intervened, he was found insane and let go, and he now lives in Italy. All this happened just within days. Now, there was no leftist that I, ever, that I encountered or heard of who said, you know, this makes sense to me, that a Muslim who wants to convert to Christianity should be executed. No one, but no one in the West said this makes sense. And therefore, the Islamist organizations and thinkers and spokesmen all backtracked and found excuses and said, well, that's not really the case. We don't really execute people, which was not true. They do execute people. But the key point I'm making here is that because the left renounced the Islamist program, the Islamists had to backtrack, apologize, obfuscate. In a case like the Danish cartoons, where the left was generally antagonistic, but not entirely so, you find that the cartoons uh, did the cartoon issue was not, as in the case of the apostasy of a Muslim, was not a slam dunk. It was not a clear case where the Islamist organizations and spokesmen had to retreat. In fact, they felt pretty confident. And then when you go to a third case, such as the balance between national security and personal rights, where the left is standing solidly with the Islamists, you find that the Islamists are very aggressive. So the key factor in how radical Islam fares in our societies is not so much the Islamist program, but how much of a support it gets from non-Muslim and specifically leftist elements. In looking back on the cartoon crisis, which began in early February, or began as an international phenomenon in early February, and lasted for about three weeks, I think the key question to ask is, what is the net effect? What is the balance? How do things look as a result of that? More specifically, are cartoonists more likely to do what they did back in September of 2005, or are they less likely? Is such an act been made more possible because of the uh, crisis, or is it less possible? And to my mind, I think there's no doubt that it's less possible. The Western world has been put on notice that there will be many deaths, there will be much protest, there will be 
economic consequences if you engage in this kind of activity. And so we are working backwards. We are less free than we were a few months ago. What would have been the solution, what would have been, I believe, the right thing to do, would have been a unanimous Western response, as in the case of the Afghan who converted to Christianity, saying, no, this is not acceptable. We do not do business like this. We do have freedom of speech, and that includes the freedom to criticize one religion or another, including Islam. It means the freedom to make fun of Jesus, to make fun of Muhammad, to make fun of uh, Muhammad. Uh, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. There is equal opportunity to criticize. But because we did not do that, because it was only a partial response, because only some newspapers, because only some television stations showed these cartoons, in effect, we had, on balance, a weakening. And that's why I'm here today, because I think it's important that we show these cartoons, that we assert the freedom we have to show these, to speak about them, to talk about these issues. I regret that we need to have security for these sort of events, but I'm delighted that we have the security. I'm delighted that the Ayn Rand Institute and the Object Objectivist Club have taken the initiative because I think in our, each of our ways we need to assert the need to demonstrate that we are free we do not live under the Sharia. We have no intention of living under the Sharia. And here is the symbol of our will. Thank you. Good evening. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Jason uh, with the USC Objectives Club and uh, my colleagues at the Ayn Rand Institute uh, for putting on, this, putting on this event. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Pipes for joining me uh, tonight uh, on this panel. And of course, Dr. Locke for, for the second time agreeing to be uh, our moderator. Why are we here? Why show the cartoons? Why is the Ayn Rand Institute now on its uh, fourth event, such event, and, and, and by the time we're finished, there'll be at least five of these all across the country. The reason we're here is, I think, that events demand it. The publication of the cartoons, the response in the Muslim world, but more importantly, if it had, is the response in the West. What was the response in the West? Well, for the most part, it was silence. It was showing the demonstrations in the Middle East, but leaving it at that. Uh, it was the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, representing both left and right, deciding not to publish the cartoons. Uh, it was Danish cartoonists going into hiding for fear of their lives. It was uh, President Bush and uh, the State Department declaring that while we all have the right to free speech, I guess in some theoretical sense, we need to use it responsibly, which in other words is, is a code name for not offending anybody, not getting anybody upset, not putting anybody at risk. I think this is a horrific response. And this is why we are doing this. We are doing this because the US government and US media have, in my view, neglected their responsibility to stand up and to defend free speech in this country. So given that our media and given that our government is not doing what is necessary, what are we to do? What are we as the citizens of a free country supposed to do? Well, I think this, this is what we're supposed to do. We need to stand up to evil. We need to refuse to be silenced. We need to show that we will exercise our rights without fear, with security, but without fear that we will not let the intimidation work. Because when those riots happened in the Middle East, what was the goal of the riots? What was the goal of burning down embassies? What was the goal of killing people? What was the goal of threatening the cartoonists with, well, where is it over there, with beheading? Behead all those who offend Islam. What is the goal of that? It is to silence us. And we, if we care about our freedoms, if we care about our right to speak. We have to stand up against that intimidation and say, no, we will not be silenced. 
we will not let you intimidate us. And if our government defaults on its responsibility to stand up to you, and, and has, as Dr. Pipes mentioned, for 17 years now, since the Salomon Rushdie affair, because, of course, the Bush, the senior, the Bush seniors administration did exactly the same thing. It, it, it indeed condemned both Rushdie and the Iranians and uh, for issuing the fatwa. If they will not do it, then we as the American people need to stand up and do it. Not only do we need to show the Muslim population or those radical Muslims who demonstrated, who would want to intimidate us, who want to silence us, but much more importantly, in my view, we need to show Americans and we need to show our own government that the American people will not be silenced, that in spite of their weakness, we are not weak. Um, and I think the importance of doing it on campuses, that all these events have been on campus, and I'm glad to see quite a few students in the audience tonight, is that the America we are talking about is the America of the future. The America where rights are going to be restricted is, the, is your America. It is the America that you are growing into, if you will, that is the rest of your lives. And it is crucial for you as students to start now defending your rights, to start now defending your freedom. If we don't, if we don't stand up, then what conclusions are the rioters going to make? What conclusions are they going to come to? Well, that we can be intimidated into silence. That today it's cartoons, tomorrow it's an editorial in the New York Times. It's what appears on the Ayn Rand Institute website or, or Dr. Pipes' website. It's other issues like food and how we treat women and so on. If they riot, if they intimidate us, if they threaten our lives, we'll just fold. We'll give in. And they can establish the Sharia law on America, on Europe, on the rest of the world as they desire. And really, if you take this even broader, what of other groups? What will they learn from this? I mean, there are plenty of groups that would love to see American society and the West change. Well, they might learn that intimidation and violence works, whether it's environmentalists on the left or whether it's uh, you know, radical Christians who would like us to behave in different ways than we behave today. If they riot, if they burn a few buildings, we'll, we'll capitulate, we'll just fold, we'll change. What is truly at stake here is our freedom, is our freedom of speech, but more broadly, all of our freedoms are at stake here, every one of them. And of course, what makes this particular issue all the more significant is that it is about freedom of speech. Because speech is the only way in which we can object. Speech is the only way that we can say, no, this is wrong. We're in this auditorium not going to raise guns and go out and, and, and burn our own buildings and demonstrations against. Our tool is reason. Our tool is discussion, is debate, it's the human mind, it's speech. And as a consequence, this issue is even more important because it is about speech. Because once speech is eliminated, we are truly defenseless. I mean, the Ayn Rand Institute has to shut down because if offending somebody is the criteria, we offend pretty much everybody. <laughs> Go to our website, you can see. Now, what do the writing Muslims want? Well, they want our submission. As Dr. Pipe said, they want us to submit to Sharia law. They want to subordinate our will, our minds, our wishes to theirs, to their faith, ultimately, to their God, to their religion. The ideology that drives them, totalitarian Islam, demands that complete subjugation of everything to their interpretation of God's words to their interpretation of Islam. Now, what kind of ideology are we talking about? Well, we're talking about an ideology that I think is illustrated in these posters and an ideology that is illustrated in their actions after the publication of the Danish cartoons. We're talking about ideology that is focused on using force, on using force to burn buildings, to riot, to kill, 
to force people into thinking, or at least pretending to think, in particular ways. This is an ideology of faith that can only deal with disagreement through violence because it has rejected explicitly the use of reason. And that is, again, what we see in the way they deal with the West. Whether it's by killing somebody because they converted, because they want to convert, or they have converted to Christianity, wanting to kill them, or whether it's letting girls die as they escape a, a burning house because they're not dressed appropriately, uh, whether it's stoning somebody uh, for adultery or beheading an infidel. Their ideology demands violence against those who disagree with them. Now, to some extent, taken seriously, all religion demands that because its tool is fundamentally faith and not reason. Christianity, Judaism, other religions have gone through a absorption of elements of reason into them over the last 200 years, 300 years, and they're nonviolent anymore. The case, the problem we face today is a violent form of religion that wants, that demands enslavement and through, through the use of force. Note here that these demonstrations, these riots, were part of a much broader war. They, were part of, they are part of a war that started decades ago. They're part of a war that was made real to the American people on September 11th. But in a sense, these riots, all of this war is meant to, to bring about the Sharia, this, this sub, subjugation. But in a sense, this is worse than September 11th. Not in what they've done, obviously, but in how we've responded. After September 11th, we were outraged. We demanded action, and indeed our, our government did act. What have we done with the Danish cartoons? Uh, we have folded, we have accepted their intimidation as our way of life, we have not acted, uh, and we have basically showed them that they can win, and I think we've just invigorated them, we've given them more, uh, more strength. I think by doing this, by having these kind of events, by standing up to them, is the only way that ultimately we can win this ideological war. Thank you. All right, here's the first question. Uh, Dr. Brooke will be the primary responder with four minutes, and Dr. Pipes will be the uh, second commentator with two minutes. Question is, what in your view is free speech. Some people claim that it's important and a value, but that certain moral limitations must be upheld. They claim that it's better to refrain from publishing offensive materials out of respect for the views of others. How do you respond to that? Free speech, is this on? Free speech is the recognition of the role of reason in human life. It is the recognition that human beings survive thrive, succeed, advance through the use of their mind. And, the, and speech is just one aspect of that. It is a way in which we communicate what we think. Uh, it is part and parcel with our reasoning, our ability to think. And the only thing that can block the ability of a human being to think is force or the threat of force is intimidation. That is what limits our ability to reason and therefore limits our ability to live, advance, progress. So if we respect reason, if we want to live in a society in which we discuss ideas, in which we prosper, in which we advance, defending our right to speech is like defending our right to think. It is essential, it is crucial. It is a direct derivative from the right to life and the right to liberty, which is in our Declaration of Independence. And it is an absolute. It is an absolute. There are no exceptions to the right of free speech. You have a right to say whatever you want to say, unless you're in violation of somebody else's rights, like the theater owner. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater because there's a 
contract. There's an implicit contract there with the theater owner. He's, he's let you in under certain conditions. You can't just say whatever you want. If you will come to my house, I have a right to kick you out if you say certain things. It's my property. I have a right. So you can't violate my rights on my property. But other than that, you can say whatever you want to say. And what's important here is that free speech is meaningless, has no meaning if it excludes the right to offend people. If we didn't offend anybody, we wouldn't need a right to free speech. We'd all, you know, we'd all be chatting about, I mean, what would that even mean? Try to imagine a world in which nobody ever offended anybody else. The whole basis for the right of free speech is the fact that we, s we sometimes disagree, and the principle is that you can't use force. We can disagree, but you can't slap me because we disagree. You can't punch me because we disagree. You can't burn down my embassy or my building because we disagree. Uh, more than that, this country was founded. Think about uh, the Declaration of Independence. What is that document? If not, an offensive document. I mean, if you were British at the time and you read it, you would have been thoroughly offended. The Founding Fathers called the British Crown a tyranny. And they called them all kinds of names and accused them of crimes and accusations. It was very offensive to the British. But that's the founding document of this country, and, it's, it's the, it, it, and it il illustrates the founding principles of this country, the principles of, of uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, under which uh, freedom of speech uh, falls. So no, you have no obligation to respect the feelings of others. How do we in the West deal with somebody offending us? Well, we ignore them, or we write a letter to the editor, or we argue against them, or we hold an event, and we discuss it. We don't go out and riot and use force. So rights uh, to protect our ability to act against the use of force. In this country, you should be able to say whatever you want without fear of being threatened with force. Thank you. Doctor? Freedom, of speech is a okay. Freedom of speech is a concept that does not really exist historically in the Muslim world. Uh, it has always been assumed that the government and the religious leaders are uh, beyond criticism. Even today, for example, many countries, the political leadership is exempt by law from criticism, and of course, um, so is Islam as such, and more particularly, specifics of Islam, and most especially, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, who is seen as someone who cannot be criticized. And what's interesting is that Muhammad, in classical Islamic understanding, is a human with human foibles. But as his reputation has grown over the centuries in common Muslim understanding, he is someone who has an exalted position and may not be criticized in any fashion. So that is the historic situation. There is no such concept as freedom of speech. In modern times, in particular in the last two centuries, Western ideas have impinged on the Muslim world, and ideas of freedom of speech can be found enshrined in many constitutions and many laws. They do tend to uh, not deal with politicians and religion, but even so, one finds occasional uh, spokesmen and women for a freedom of speech position who will go out and criticize, and indeed we have in the audience today one notable instance of that, Dr. Wafa Sultan of Syria, who's now resident in this area, who was on Al Jazeera in late February and made these points to an Arabic-speaking, predominantly Muslim audience, and um, uh, did so with great elan. These sorts of uh, incidents do take place, but they take place within the context of bringing what is basically a Western concept to the Middle East, it does, or to the Muslim world. It does not exist historically in the Muslim world. Okay, I've been asked to announce if, if he wished to hand in a written question as opposed to oral question, and we'll take both. Please pass them to the outside end of the aisles, and they'll be picked up. Uh, we won't guarantee to answer 
everyone, but we'll answer as many as we can before we have to close. Second question, Dr. Pipes will be the primary responder with four minutes. What do you make of the reaction of the cartoons in the Islamic world? What do you say to the claim that Islam is a religion of peace in the light of the violent demonstrations we've witnessed? Uh, by my count, that's two questions, and they're fairly different. Um, on the question of the reaction of the cartoons in the Muslim world, uh, there was a genuine and uh, nearly universal horrified reaction precisely for the reasons I just explained. In the Muslim world, uh, one does not encounter criticisms of this sort, particularly this cartoon. Uh, it is unheard of, and therefore the body politic doesn't have a, uh, an ability to cope with something like this. We who live in a free society are used to this kind of caricature and a lot stronger than this one, I might point out. Um, in the Muslim world, caricatures are made of others, Americans, Israelis, Danes, yeah, to be sure, but one's own leader or one's own religious uh, sensibilities are left untouched, and therefore there was a deep and abiding shock at the audacity of anyone who would do such a thing, and indeed many have shown a, a horror, and a genuine horror, and a horror which has to be understood in context. These are people who are not exposed routinely to such uh, give and take. Um, the reaction expressed itself in a number of countries in violence. I suspect few of you know the country where there was the most violence. It was Nigeria, where on, uh, no one exactly knows, but something like 150 or maybe 200 dead as a result of internecine fighting between Christian and Muslim groups in Nigeria. In northern Nigeria, the uh, Muslim elements attack Christian elements as though the Christian Nigerians had anything to do with these cartoons, but they were a kind of local stand-in. And in reaction in the south of the country, uh, where the Christians predominated, they in turn attacked Muslims. Um, there were violence, of course, in Syria and Lebanon with the um, burning of the embassy, which could have had state support in some fashion, in Pakistan and in many other countries. In all, several hundred people probably died as a result of this, which, by the way, was more than the Rushdie affair, which I think had about 60 deaths. Um, a second question was, what do I say to the claim that Islam is a religion of peace in the light of these violent demonstrations? Well, the president often referred, or no, initially after 9-11, several times referred to Islam as a religion of peace. Um, I took objection to it then and continue to it now. Not that I would say that Islam is a religion of violence or Islam is a religion of anything else. I would say that it is not possible to define a historical phenomenon of 1,400 years in one word. Uh, one sees in different places and different times different Islams. Islam has been quietist. Islam has been aggressive. Uh, it has been many things over this period of time and over in many places, and I would not believe, I do not believe it is correct to take a single term to essentialize it and to ignore all these differences. Furthermore, uh, Islam has inherent to it the notion of jihad, which has historically meant the spread of Muslim rule to new territories, not the spread of Islamic religion to new peoples, but the extension of Muslim rule to new territories, and that has, by necessity, required violent action. Um, jihad doesn't have to be violent, but historically it has predominantly been violent, and therefore, in its very core, Islam has a military component against non-Muslims that cannot be papered over. Thank you. Dr. Brooke will have a two-minute comment. Oh, I, I think I've said something about the uh, reaction of the cartoons in, in, in the Islamic world. Uh, they obviously, uh, as Dr. Pipe stated, um, they don't have the concept of, of freedom of speech, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, criticizing uh, their own religion, and they responded with violence, uh, horrific violence um, across the entire Middle East. Um, the issue of, of whether Islam is a religion of peace, uh, let me just note that in my view, no religion can be viewed as a religion of peace. Uh, as I said briefly uh, before, 
any um, system of thought that relies primarily, uh, that wants to grow and relies primarily on faith, um, and the more consistently it relies on faith, the more it is going to use force, the more it is going to use violence. If you reject reason as a tool for con convincing people, as a tool for arguing with people, as a tool to change people's minds, then what is left? If you can't reason with them, and I think inherent in faith, inherent in religion, is the inability to reason with somebody about something that is inherently not part of this reality, uh, not, not part of this world. It relies completely on faith. And therefore, ultimately, in every religion's history, every religion's history, when it is taken seriously, when it is taken consistently, it has turned to violence, whether it's Christianity during the Inquisition, uh, whether it's uh, you know, Judaism in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, no religion, when it's expanding, when it's trying to bring in new recruits, if you will, can stay uh, peaceful. And of course, today, Islam is nothing but a, a religion of peace, at least not as it is manifest in the people who claim to speak for it. All right, thank you. Uh, third question, Dr. Brooke will have the first four-minute reply. Can you comment on the reaction of the Western media and intellectuals to the cartoon controversy? Why have so few supported the Danish newspaper? <laughs> well, the response, again, as, I, as I've already mentioned, the response, I think, of, of the Western media and Western intellectuals has been pathetic, to put it mildly. Um, other than, I think, uh, I think it's the, the only one is the Philadelphia Inquirer that published one cartoon. There might have been one other. I don't think a single major U.S. newspaper uh, published the cartoons. Uh, none of the networks, maybe, I think Fox gave a glimpse of them once, but none of the networks have really uh, published them. Uh, the intellectuals have either been silent uh, or have been uh, against the publication uh, of these cartoons in the name of... Uh, uh, you know, being, uh, being responsible media, you know, acting responsibly. Let me say what I think the media should have done, uh, what I think the response should have been in, in contrast. I think that as soon as the lives of the cartoonists were threatened, as soon as intimidation was used, every single media outlet in the United States should have published every single one of the cartoons, if possible, on the front page. You know, there's a scene, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Spartacus, but there is a scene, it's a great movie, so I highly recommend it. There's a scene at the end of the movie where the Romans, they've got all the slaves, these rebellious slaves, hundreds of them, and the question is asked, who is Spartacus? And, and uh, Cook Douglas plays Spartacus, and he's about to get up, and one of the people, in the, in, in, one of the slaves gets up and says, I am Spartacus. And then another one gets up and says, I am Spartacus, and soon enough, Everybody has stood up and said, I am Spartacus. In the face of intimidation, the Western media should have stood up and said, we are all Danes. We are Spartacus. We will, if, if you want to intimidate Western media, you have to intimidate all of us. And of course, if everybody becomes a target, if every single news outlet in the United States becomes a target, then nobody is a target. It's only when you can say it's 12 cartoonists or there's one newspaper or there's five newspapers. It's only then then there's a real risk and there's real intimidation. But when everybody stands with those cartoonists, nothing would have happened. Let me, let me, then, let me just address what I think the U.S. government should have done. The U.S. Gov government should have explicitly articulated the fact that we live in a country that respects freedom of speech. It should have said that it will not tolerate, will not tolerate any threats to the lives of U.S. citizens, to the lives of the media, to the New York Times, and that if there are threats emanating from any countries out there, they will demand that those countries arrest the people threatening. Um, that, and if not, then that is as close to a declaration of war as you can come to when, 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 a, when a citizen of a particular country threatens the citizens of the United States and its own government will not stop them, then it's open season for the United States to go after those people itself. Uh, the United States should have stood up 
and defended the rights of, of its media, of Borders Bookstore, which is now not carrying the magazine Free Inquiry because Free Inquiry is going to publish the cartoon, so Borders has announced we're not going to carry this because we're afraid. And you know what? I can't blame them because the U.S. government has defaulted on its one responsibility to protect our lives. It has defaulted on that. And therefore, while I think that it's cowardly a border to do so, you know, you can't blame them when they get the sense that their lives are really in danger and the cost of protecting their stores would bankrupt them. That is the job of the U.S. military and the U.S. police, not the job of private security firms. Thank you. I'd like, uh, I'd like to associate minutes, myself with the... Uh, with Dr. Brooke's comment about uh, every media outlet should have published this. I very much believe the same thing. Uh, it's an interesting footnote to this uh, car cartoon crisis that they were first published, other than the Hulans post and original page, the second place they were published was an Al-Fajr newspaper in in Egypt in October, mid-October of last year. And they were presented in the context of, look at what the Danes are saying. The paper came, the paper left, no one paid it any attention. It's a footnote, it had no importance. But it is important in retrospect because it shows that the response to these cartoons in of themselves was mild. <coughs> it took a provocateur it took an agent to turn these cartoons into what they became. In the Rushdie case, it was Ayatollah Khomeini. In this case, it was a Palestinian imam in Denmark called Abu Laban, who made it his issue and who agitated both within Denmark. And then when that didn't get far, he went to the organization of the Islamic Conference, which could be considered the Islamic version of the United Nations, a group of some 57, I believe, states that meet every so often. And he brought these cartoons to them. And in addition, he conjured up three fraudulent cartoons, and brought th which were even more aggressively uh, understood in Muslim eyes. And he showed these 15 cartoons around at the OIC meeting and started things rolling at that point. It's also noteworthy that there were editors in Jordan and Malaysia who published these cartoons to their detriment. They lost their jobs, went to jail. Um, it is noteworthy that in Europe, a number of major publications, including François and Die Welt, published these cartoons, several newspapers in Italy. Um, so it was not, it was not, it was not Denmark left alone to hang. It was the Europeans with some solidarity, or European editors and publishers, joining in. Uh, that it, is, it could have been a lot worse. The Danes could have been isolated in a way they were not. Um, intellectuals avoided the question. Uh, one found very little comment uh, from intellectuals. And this was quite in contrast to the quite parallel events of 17 years ago when Rushdie himself being an intellectual figure garnered great intellectual support. For example, American Pen and other Pen uh, affiliates of authors, of well-known authors, came to his support. One didn't find a similar kind of intellectual support this time. Uh, I would again note what I said before about the left. When the left is solidly in your with the rest of us, uh, then we have an isolation of the Islamists. The left was moderately solid on this question, so it came out moderately bad as opposed to terribly bad. It could have been worse. It could have been Denmark all by itself. And as it turned out, it was not. It was a quasi-European issue. As Dr. Brook po points out, American newspapers didn't. I'm a little bit more lenient on them because I figure that this wasn't really an American issue. It was more a European issue. It was the EU together, and the EU did a reason, or the editors, not the states, but the editors in the EU did a pretty good job of standing solidly with their Danish compatriots. So, poor marks, but they could have been worse. And I was surprised, actually, in retrospect, that the European editors did what they did. It took a strength that I wouldn't have expected to see in them. Thank you.
Next question, Dr. Brooke will have the primary response of four minutes. What impact do you think the cartoon crisis is going to have on free speech in the United States? Well, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on whether we stand up against uh, the silence uh, that has occurred. It depends on whether we stand up to uh, both our intellectuals, to our media outlets, and ultimately uh, to our government. Uh, I fear that long term uh, this is not going well, uh, that there are too few of us standing up uh, to, uh, on this issue. Uh, there are too few of us who are advocating uh, for the uh, absolutism of freedom of speech, uh, for not allowing intimidation uh, to silence. But this is not going to happen tomorrow. We're not going to suddenly wake up in a world where Americans don't have free speech. It's free speech. This is, if it's going to go bad, it's going to go bad slowly through very small steps. Uh, when countries commit suicide, they don't do it all at once. They do it in small increments. Um, this is, I, I think, a, a, a very poor uh, showing for America in terms of defending uh, free speech. Uh, particularly because of the uniqueness of free speech in this country. I think Europeans have a far a different tradition of free speech. Well, there's generally Europe has more kind of uh, rules against what they called hate speech and, and so on. Uh, we do not have that. We, we have traditionally viewed speech in an absolute way. And the fact that we in this country, with so much part of our tradition, uh, was silent on it does not bode well for the future. So this is going to be an incremental thing, and, and I think that it's going to be important as more and more challenges are made to free speech, that we stand up, that we advocate the, the free speech position, that we reject the notion that offending somebody is, uh, it, it does not qualify under free speech or that we have to be responsible in what we say. Uh, we have to stand up against that, and we have to fight it. Uh, but, you know, there are already signs of, of a deterioration of free speech in America, whether it's uh, a variety of different speech codes on campuses. I mean, this is not a new phenomena, and I think it's just going to intensify. This has just reaffirmed it, if you will. There are a variety of different speech codes, a variety of different issues that you can't discuss on American campuses, a, a variety of different words you're not allowed to use uh, on American campuses and in the media. Um, you know, and there, there are other ways in which free speech is, is being violated where this understanding of free speech as, as an absolute right and what that means is lacking in American society. Uh, so whether it's FCC fines against TV shows that some bureaucrat finds offensive or whether it's deans who do not allow the showing of the cartoons on the campus like happened at, at NYU at an event that we did uh, last week, this is this is slow, but it's slow, constant erosion in this freedom, and it's really up to us and to you as students uh, to stand up and reject the notion that free speech has bounds, that free speech has limits. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pipes. The privileging of Islam is moving apace. Let me give you a few instances. In Australia, two evangelical preachers of Pakistani origin uh, gave a private seminar on Islam where they said some rather hostile things. In the back of the room, prompted by a government agency, were some note takers and um, digital recorder holders who then went to the authorities and said, look, this is hate speech. Those two preachers are, have been found guilty and are awaiting sentencing. They might, they probably will be going to jail for this. In Canada, an evangelical uh, man was uh, protesting the use of a public high school by Muslim students for prayer, pointing out that Christian students could not do the same. He was found crimi criminally negligent and was sentenced to a certain number of community hours that he had to serve at an Islamic organization. In Britain, about two months ago, a law was nearly passed. It lost 283 to 282, and it only lost because the Prime Minister of Britain was told that he, this would pass and he could go home. Had he stayed, it would have passed. 
uh, it's a religious incitement law that would have effects such as in Australia. We have a First Amendment, they don't. Uh, we are less prone to that kind of criminal legislation against free speech and criticizing religion. But even here, one sees this kind of privileging take place. Um, one sees it in the kind of examples that Dr. Brooke gave, but one sees it in lesser ways as well. My favorite example, though it's not an American one, is Nat West, a leading British bank, which used to give out piggy banks. Well, guess what? It doesn't give out piggy banks anymore for fear of offending anyone. I mean, we're getting to the point, especially in Britain, far more worse than here, far worse than here, where there's a a uh, reluctance to engage in what have been habitual and normal and unoffending habits out of fear of uh, offending uh, Muslims because they are imposing their Islamic legal ways, their shari ways, on ourselves. I say no. We do not want to live by the Sharia. Thank you. Thank you. Final, final question. Dr. Pipes will be the first responder for four minutes. Do you see any trends or care to project future trends in the relation between Islam and the West? I'd make two points. First, I see a, an incipient separation of civilizations, not clash of civilizations, but separation. I note, and this is larger than the cartoon crisis, but includes it. I, include, I note a kind of mutual distaste that one sees between Muslims and Westerners that takes form in a number of ways. For example, the uh, irritation, the mutual irritation and lack of comprehension over this cartoon issue. One sees it over the uh, Afghan who converted to Christianity. Total, mis, uh, d total lack of communication, total difference of viewpoint. But one sees it in more specific and, and material ways. One sees a separation of money it used to be that a lot of m money from the Muslim world, in particular Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states, would come here and to Europe. One sees less of it coming here, by far. The numbers are quite dramatic. I think that 25, this is an estimate, something like $25 billion came from Saudi Arabia in 2000, and now it's in the order of one or two billion. Uh, one sees in terms of movement of people. Tourists are less going to places like Tunisia or uh, Egypt uh, because of problems they worry about there. Uh, conversely, students are coming less to the West. So I think while I wouldn't want to exaggerate the scope of this, I think what one sees as the beginnings of a mutual uh, distancing between Muslims and Westerners. Finally, I'd like to note that the key question in terms of future trends is whether we in the West cherish our historic ways or whether we're willing to give them up. Do we want to keep the Quran, do we want to keep the Constitution as our basic document or are we willing to substitute it with the Quran? That is ultimately what the question comes down to because there is in this country a growing body of people who say that what we have here is inferior to what they are bringing with them. We have a growing population in this country that is arguing that they are bringing with them an ideology of radical Islam that is superior to what we have here. It's not to say all Muslims want this. It is to say that there is a certain body of radical Muslims who believe that there is a Shari way, a, a Islamic law that projects a form of government that is superior to what we have in the West. And it is up to Westerners to decide whether they will accept that and change their ways or whether they will stand up for their historic ways and customs. That is ultimately the question that faces us as Westerners. Thank you. Dr. Burke. Yeah, I'd like to definitely second that last statement by Dr. Pipes. I agree with it completely, and I think that is the core issue that we face. We would, I think we are at war today. Uh, we are at war with an ideological enemy. There is an ideological struggle that, is, that is, has turned over the last 25, 30 years violent. 
uh, whether it was with the taking of the hostages in Tehran in 79, whether it's the numerous terrorist attacks since, whether it's the Salman Rushdie affair or these cartoons, or of course, September 11th, there is a violent struggle. But note that if it was just an issue of weapons and armies and military might, this would be over very, very quickly. Uh, the United States has the mightiest military in human history, never mind in the world today. The problem the West faces is an issue of will, the will to use that military in this conflict, and more fundamentally, the will to stand for our values, the will to stand for the ideas that we believe in, the will to stand and reject Sharia, reject Islamic uh, fascism, reject these ideologies that want to ensla enslave us, and we can only reject them if we have something positive to offer as an alternative. And that's why the left cannot reject, and in my view, the right cannot reject today, because they do not have that respect for the founding principles. It's been watered down by multiculturalism, it's been watered down by, by ideologies that have been prevalent on university campuses for the last hundred years. We need to resurrect the pride, the understanding of our founding principles and be willing to fight and die in order to preserve them because they are the foundations of our freedom and without that willingness to fight, we will commit suicide because they won't beat us. We will beat ourselves. We will, we will commit suicide um, as a consequence. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, before we have to leave the building, close to an hour and a half for questions. So here are the rules for the question period. Uh, we'll accept either written or oral questions. Questions accompanied by insults will not be answered. Also, please do not give speeches. This is a question period. If you want to give a speech, you'll have to organize your own panel. So I'm going to start with two written questions, then I'll take two oral questions, and I'll go back and forth. So I think this first one is for Dr. Pipes. Has Christianity no violence or bloodshed in its history? Under the Reconquista of Spain in 1492, Jews, Muslims, and all minority religious groups were forced to leave. When does Islamic history begin for Dr. Pipes? Post-1900 or since its inception? Well, I actually got my PhD in the history of Islam in the 7th and 8th centuries, so <laughs> it does begin back then. Um, by the way, the, the, there'll be one-minute answers uh, in order to ensure that we will get through as many questions as we can. Does your interrupting count on my time? <laughs> you get extra time for that. Uh, yes, of course, Christianity has a uh, violent history, as does Islam. And one could give a better example than the Reconquista. One could give the Crusades as the paramount violent act of Christianity. Uh, I wouldn't say that Christianity is a religion of peace either, nor that it's a religion of war. Christianity has changed. And just as Christianity has had different forms over two millennia, so has Islam. Uh, the point is at this time that with rare exceptions, uh, Christianity is not a violent religion, has changed. Uh, there are exceptions to be sure, but it is no longer the violent religion that it once was. Islam is a more violent religion than it ever was in the past. A traditional Muslim, a say 14th century Muslim, would not recognize the September 11th assault as something uh, that is within Islam. You don't go out and murder people going to work in a foreign country like that. So is, uh, while Christianity has become more peaceable, Islam has become more violent. Dr. Brooke, do you wish to comment on that question? Uh, just, just briefly, I, I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right. And I think the, 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 what's happened, I think, to Christianity and to religion in the West that has not happened uh, to Islam is the introduction of reason into, uh, into Western thought. Uh, the West went through an enlightenment. Uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas brought Aristotelian Greek uh, ideas about reason uh, and about the human mind, about rational thought into the religions. 
um, you know, imperfectly as that combination might work, it has definitely eliminated, at least for now, the use of force uh, by, you know, the, the predominant number of Christians and, and other religionists in our culture. And when I, I think when what Islam needs, as, as any religion needs, is, is exactly that. It, it needs to rediscover or to discover reason. Uh, it needs to discover rationality, and, and, and that brings about a respect for the individual and a respect for discourse rather than uh, an, an abandonment of violence. Okay, next question. Um, I'll put to Dr. Brook first. What are the reasons for the protest aside from an ideological one? Do you believe it had anything to do with the economic situation they, apparently Muslims, what they mean, live in? I have a difficult time believing that this situation is purely ideological and has nothing to do with the political and economic situation in these places. Please address these issues. Well, I think it's predominantly ideological. It's predominantly ideological because the cultures in these countries are predominantly religious cultures. Even the so-called secular Arab countries like Syria uh, and like uh, Lebanon and Egypt have significant parts of their population that are radically uh, Islamic. They, 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 they take this uh, radical Islamism, uh, Islamic totalitarian ideology seriously. Now, as Dr. Pipe stated, originally when the cartoons were published, nothing much happened. It took some inciting. It took inciting by religious leaders. Uh, I think it started with the Palestinian imam, and then it, it kind of, he went to the Middle East, and it spread through other imams. And, you know, they, uh, there's reason to believe uh, that some of the countries, uh, maybe the Syrian government, the Iranian government, uh, sponsored these or helped them along or supported them. But look, Terrorism in general, violence in general, are not a socio-economic phenomena. They are not a socio-economic phenomena. Poor people in non-Islamic countries don't fly airplanes into buildings. That is not how they express their frustration at being poor. And if they're frustrated at being poor, why lash out at the Danes? They should be lashing out at their own regimes that are keeping them poor because they're keeping them enslaved. Okay, we'll take uh, questions from the floor. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Not only is it not a matter of poverty, but the record shows repeatedly that the most virulent Islamists come from rather prosperous, affluent, and privileged, uh, educated and privileged uh, backgrounds. Take the 9-11 hijackers. Take the four um, British bombers last July. Uh, that's terrorists in particular. But more broadly, if you look at the Islamist movements in, in throughout the world, you see that um, their main support comes from the middle classes, if anything. But it is basically not having to do with rich, with wealth. What it has to do is a sense of identity and a sense of grievance. That the Muslim world is not flourishing as it was in centuries past. And that the way to bring the Muslim world back to its prosperity and strength is by returning to this imagined form of Islam that we're calling radical Islam. It has nothing to do with personal circumstances, nothing to do with poverty. Okay, uh, Miss, I guess we, we would like you to be at the microphone, so the lady, you're first. Thank you. You can address either panelist or both. Actually, I'm, I'm not really sure whom to address this question. Um, but I am puzzled about something. Um, there are some who believe that we should all have the right to free speech, but that we should impose a sort of moral restraint. But I'm wondering, whose moral restraint? You could say mine, but I imagine that my morals are somewhat different from some of yours. So is it your morals? And if so, why? Why are your morals better than mine? Or better than his? or better than anyone else's. I mean, even if your God is, is giving you the moral high ground, that judgment's not really meted out until you're dead. So uh, in the meantime, I'm wondering if someone can answer that. Good luck. Sorry. <laughs> well, I know it wasn't a question. <laughs> now, I know it wasn't really a question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that is exactly why I think freedom of speech is an absolute and that you cannot enforce, you should not, and cannot enforce moral standards because then it becomes exactly what you stated. Whose moral standards? Uh, 
who gets to decide uh, which God uh, and who has he whispered to lately? You know, who's the latest prophet that he's whispered the truth to? Because they're competing versions of what God tends to whisper to people. Um, and what about people who don't believe in God? Uh, so there is no standard by which we can define what is responsible free speech. And that's why, that is why we need complete freedom. Indeed, many of the people who have advanced civilization, who have advanced humanity, were considered heretics. Uh, Galileo is, of course, the classical example. And, and many, many people who burnt at the stake during the Middle Ages and so on were, it, were saying something new and different that didn't fit into the morals of the period. And therefore, uh, you know, were burnt or killed or, or imprisoned. So you cannot put a, a moral standard or any, kind of, any other kind of standard on speech, it needs to be free. And that's what morality actually demands, because that's what human life actually demands, free speech. Dr. Pipes, you OK? Next uh, questioner. Thank you. An Iranian newspaper shortly after the media explosion of the Mohammed cartoons announced a cartoon competition of Holocaust cartoons. The newspaper's reasons for hosting this competition were to highlight the fact that anti-Semitic cartoons, less than complementary, complementary to Jews, the Jewish experience, or the Jewish uh, culture of exploiting past victimization, um, would not be published in Western papers, let alone be defended because of their subjectivity to the label anti-Semitic. If you had a paper, would you publish these Holocaust cartoons? Do you think that to be anti-Semitic has the same social connotations as to be anti-Islamic? And if not, what accounts for this difference? You raised a lot of questions. That's a, lot, that's a long question. Who would like to go for Dr. Pipes? You raised a lot of questions. First, the uh, Muslim media is filled with the most vile anti-Semitic cartoons. Far, far worse than any of these here. Vile to the nth degree. And so it is a little bit hypocritical that those who engage in these vile assaults in another religion are demanding complete impunity for their own. <laughs> Secondly, freedom of speech means freedom established by the government that we can say what we want and none of us will go to jail and we'll be protected for saying what we want. It does not imply that every newspaper owner is required to publish anything that you happen to send to him. There, there's not a freedom of speech within, say, a newspaper or television station. The editor or the uh, producer has the right to decide what he or she wants to do. Um, thirdly, it is rather telling that the Iranians would come up with this notion of uh, making fun of the Holocaust uh, when we are so used to. I mean, it ma makes no difference to us. More cartoons, more anti-Semitic cartoons. Do any of us respond with shock to that? These are banal. These are well, we, anyone can go, go see them. I mean, you can, they're, they're, they're in the culture all the time. Where, ex where exactly are they? Well, it's <laughs> not, not particularly, I mean, it's not particularly a source of great humor the murder of six million people, but I can assure you that there are plenty of publications in this country and in other Western countries, and especially in this country, because we have the greatest freedom of speech, which are ridiculing the Holocaust and denying the Holocaust and the like. This is ordinary. This is pure pablum for us. It doesn't shock anybody. Have you seen any of these cartoons? Does anybody care to reproduce them? They're irrelevant to us. Nobody's burning embassies or engaging in widespread in, uh, hostilities or you know, in the sort of Re response as the Muslim world had, because we're used to this. Our th skins are thickened by the fact that we are used to the free flow of ideas. The Muslim world is not used to that and therefore responds with this horrified reaction of, uh, you know, how can you do this? But there's no comparison. Dr. Dr. Brooke. Yeah, I mean, there, there was really no comparison. Um, First of all, anybody in the United States should have a right to publish anti, you know, uh, uh, cartoons that, that ridicule the Holocaust. And indeed, as Dr. Pipe stated, they're all over the web. Uh, just go and find them. And there are publications indeed dedicated to anti-Semitism and uh, neo-Nazi literature. It, it is, does exist in the United States. 
it is available, as horrific as it is. But more than that, what are we comparing here? We're comparing ridiculing or making fun of the murder of six million innocent individuals to the portrayal of Muhammad with a bomb in his turban. Now, it's not a great cartoon, or, but it represents a real issue. There are people out there in the world right now blowing themselves up in the name of Muhammad. And that's what this cartoon illustrates. It illustrates the fact that there are people <laughs> who in the name of their religion, Islam, are blowing themselves up. So this is a debatable cartoon. It's something that's of interest. It's something that needs to be debated. There's nothing to debate about the, the, the murder of six million Jews. So they're not commensurable in any way. Um, Add to that the fact that what we object, to, what we are objecting to here, and the reason we're publishing these cartoons, is because of the response. If every time a a, a uh, anti uh, a, a cartoon ridiculing the Holocaust were published in the United States, Jews walked out into the streets of Manhattan and burned down buildings and burned down embassies and went to the Midwest and found a few rednecks and and hung them up. I don't know then I'd be having a panel here condemning their actions. That would be wrong. That would be wrong. It is violence that we're condemning. It is the violent response to the cartoons that we're condemning. And it is the complete and utter intolerance in the, in the Muslim world today for dissenting ideas that we're condemning. An intolerance that does not exist in the West. It does not exist in the West. Okay, I'll go back to two written questions. Um, this is really related to the last one. How do you respond to the Austrian government's imprisonment of the British historian David Irving, who had denied the existence of the Holocaust? Is this an insult to his freedom of speech? Uh, please comment. Yes, in, in my view, it is an insult to his freedom of speech. I, I do not believe in, in laws against hate speech. Uh, even when that hate is targeted against uh, Jews, even when that speech is targeted against uh, Christians, even when that speech is as horrific as to deny, as it is to, and stupid and irrational as it is to deny the existence of the Holocaust. The best thing for people like that is just let them say this nonsense in their own publications, in their own little groups, in their own forums, and for the rest of us to ignore it because it's stupid and ridiculous. Uh, what you don't, there's, it is a violation of free speech uh, to put people like that in jail. Now let me make one distinction that I haven't had a chance to make, but this might be an opportunity. And that is between speech and the inc inciting to violence. Inciting to violence, what these guys are doing here with their, with their placards calling for beheading, and, and, and expressing the willingness to do that, it's not just a sign, it's that they're willing to do this, is not speech, it is violence, it is violence. So when, when a mafia boss sends his henchmen to kill, we don't prosecute him on hate speech, we prosecute him for murder. When you incite for the murder of people, I'm not talking about, talking about ideas that might be interpreted by somebody, I'm talking about literally say, death to Americans, behead the cartoonists, that is not speech, that is violence. And therefore, that is prosecutable uh, as a violent crime. I think, did you have a comment? I think that answers this next question. Please comment on the Islamic response as simply their own exercise of their right to freedom of speech. I think he's made clear that it's the actions that's, that are relevant. Well, not to here. mention the killing and the and the destruction of buildings and the burning and you know it's more it was more than just placards. Okay, um, here's one that's just an, an insult, so I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, uh, say, did I do two? Yeah. No, I didn't do. T I only did. Well, the problem is I want to try to. You can come up afterwards. I'm trying to get things that were not answered already. Um, is if this, 
is about freedom of speech, why weren't the comics of Jesus published by the same newspaper, and why is Holocaust denial a crime? Isn't that freedom of speech? I just a comment. Uh, just a comment on the issue of, of Jesus. I mean, <laughs> where have you been, people? I mean, the, 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 the number of, you know, just ridiculous depictions and, and you know, of, of Jesus in American newspapers and American art museums all over the place, but that's the difference. How do we deal with that in the West? Well, we write a letter to the editor saying we don't like it. We, we boycott the museum. We, you know, we ignore it. We argue, we have a debate, we, we you know, lobby Congress to restrict money to the you know, endow National Endowment for the Arts. We deal with it in a reasonable, in a reason-oriented way. That in contrast, again, with you know, what, what, how the Muslims reacted in the Middle East by, again, burning buildings, killing people, uh, by inciting violence, by calling for the killing of, uh, of, uh, of these artists. Okay, um, you're next. Hi. Um, this question is for Dr. Pipes. Dr. Pipes, how do you reconcile your vehement defense of free speech tonight um, with the founding operation of Campus Watch, an organization, um, for those who don't know, uh, that actually tries to curb academic discourse on Middle East issues on American universities? Don't you think universities should have the same rights? Actually tries to curb free discussion on universities. Is that what Campus Watch is about? Have you been to Free Campus Watch? Have you been to the Campus Watch website? Not personally. All right. <laughs> the Campus Watch homepage describes the purpose of Campus Watch, which is an organization or a project that I started in September 2002. And its goal is to critique Middle East studies in the United States and Canada. Just as theater critics go to the theater and tell you if it's a good play or a bad play, just as political analysts give you an assessment of the politician, whether he's doing a good job or a bad job, just as Consumer Reports tells you whether it's a good vacuum cleaner or toaster, so we are saying good job or bad job. Now, if you could explain to me how that is curtailing anyone's free speech, I would be very interested in learning the answer. We at Campus Watch are a small think tank. They have yet to give us powers of incarceration or arrest. <laughs> We have yet to go into anyone's classroom and close it down. We have no such powers. We don't seek them. What we seek to do is critique. Now, what happens is the university, uh, some university professors are uh, so immune, so inured to such, or you know, it's parallel to what I was saying about the Muslim world. They're not used to criticism, and so university professors are used to the. Um, to, to not being criticized, to the adulation of their students, and the respectful treatment of their peers, and don't get criticized. And we say these are people who are out there in newspapers, out there on television, out there in books. They're giving important interpretations of absolutely vital issues, like the, what is the nature of jihad and who is the enemy. And therefore, we have the right, absolute right, to criticize them, as they have the absolute right to give their interpretations. They have the right to give their interpretations. We have the right to critique them. Sounds good to me. Doesn't sound good to you? OK. Yeah, I mean, Campus Watch is a wonderful expression of the existence of free speech in the United States. It is an illustration of free speech. Look, the only way to violate somebody's rights the only way to violate somebody's freedom of speech is by using force, is by using a gun. And Dr. Pipes said it exactly. He has no ability to incarcerate professors who he doesn't agree with. And I'm sure, you know, and he's, he's not advocating for that. He's not intimidating professors by saying, if you don't advocate my position, we're going we're gonna to kill you, or we're going to blow up your car, or we're going to... There's no, the only way you can violate somebody's rights is by use of force. And by having a website that presents a different position than the position presented on universities all across the country, that is an expression of more freedom of speech. There's nothing that represses freedom of speech in that. Okay, next question. I just have a 
question about some of the things that were said earlier. Um, let's see. It was said that every single U.S. publication should have published the cartoons, and then it was said that it was open season for the U.S. to go after these people. Um, I guess before I continue with the, the question, I'd like to know exactly what is meant by open season and going after and which people we're referring to. Because well, I don't feel like I can... I sure, can since it was my comment, uh, it is open season to go after anybody who threatens the lives of Americans and where the government... Let's say, I, I remember there was a Pakistani... You mean threaten as in make a statement? Let me, let me finish and I'll, okay. I'll, I'll make clear what I mean. Uh, there was a Pakistani imam that uh, declared a million-dollar reward uh, for uh, the head, if you will, of, the cart of a cartoonist. Uh, that person is the equivalent of the head of a mafia sending his henchmen to commit murder. He is a murderer. Uh, and if the Pakistani government won't do anything about it, I think that the U.S. government has a duty to do something about it. And doing something about it means, you know, arresting him if possible or killing him if, if possible. That's what it means. Okay. <laughs> okay so what's we are talking about killing him, though, for a, uh, you said he declare, made, it, made it for a declaration that he made. He look, has no, he, he's taken no actual look, actions. I have already that said correct? that inciting violence, I've given the example of a mafia leader, I don't know what more I can do, inciting violence calling on people to murder other people is violence. Somebody, if I stand up here and say, and, and with legitimacy, because you're real passionate about what I say and you're going to follow me because I'm your imam or I'm your leader or whatever, go kill her, then I am inciting murder. I am the equivalent of a murderer uh, and the police should come in here and arrest me. Uh, that is not an issue of free speech. I it agree. is an issue of violence. I agree. There is also, there's, there's okay, a number of question. references. Okay, you got one question, so could you tell us what you want to ask? Quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, I asked one question a long line. Already. There's a long line behind you. Okay, I just, I, as far as the references that are made over and over to Muslims, to Americans, to Danish, you, you tend to put people into these large groups. And as an alleged rational thinker, I'm not sure why you think it's necessary to identify individuals by their memberships in these particular groups and make irrational judgments based on these stereotypes rather than using your mind to formulate your opinions of individuals as you meet them and can base them on the real evidence. I grew people based on the ideas they espouse. Uh, I have nothing against Muslims. Indeed, we have here, uh, you know, Muslims that I would be happy to be very I'm glad to hear that. very friendly with if they espouse ideas that are not threatening to my life. People who believe, people who believe today in Islamic totalitarianism, radical Islam, jihadists, whatever you want, you know, there are a variety of different ways uh, to describe this, but in the notion that they should uh, force Sharia down my throat, all of our throats. I group them all together. Absolutely. They are the enemy. Uh, and we are at war with that enemy. Uh, the enemy is not everyone who believes in Islam. But it is everyone, everyone who uh, burnt buildings, who supported the flying of airplanes into buildings and killing 3,000 Americans. Everyone who supports the, the insurgents in Iraq, everyone who supports violence as a way of dealing with the West is my enemy. I'm grouping them based on their ideas. Uh, indeed, not all Americans are good guys. Uh, but in a discussion where we're talking about cultures, countries, it is inevitable to talk about Americans having certain values. Sure, there are Americans that I love and the Americans that I hate. But as a country, we as Americans, qua country, respect individual rights, freedom of speech. That is a particular ideology that I support, that I think is good, absolutely good. And anybody who rejects that and is, will, and is trying to force us to change through the use of force, violence, is wrong, is evil, is bad, and is the enemy. Simple. May I ask for... No. Thank you.
Okay, back to written questions. Now, this is a wonderful question because it's so much modern universities. So let me read it. Epis this is on the epistemology of knowledge or reason. Uh, it's conditioned by our surroundings, our culture, our environment, our history, our values. What makes US, quote, reason, unquote, superior to Muslims, quote, Sharia laws, unquote, they may be rational, quote, unquote, to followers of Islam. Well, it, ultimately, ultimately, it is a matter of personal choice. Um, I don't believe that it is illegitimate to support the application of the Sharia. It is a point of view. I reject it. I personally don't want to live under the Sharia. I doubt that many Americans do. And I'm calling on fellow Americans, fellow Westerners, to reject the Sharia. Now, why do I object to the Sharia? For a very wide range of reasons. It is a religious law dating to the 7th century. It was formulated over several centuries following the 7th century uh, that has ideas about, or precepts, about human interactions that are utterly foreign in many specifics to what we as Americans hold uh, dear. Uh, if Americans writ large choose the Sharia over the Constitution, that is their right. I will argue against it. I don't want to live as, say, the, uh, as, say that the Afghans did under the Taliban. I don't want to live in that kind of society where, for example, women are not only not allowed to work, but not even allowed to go to school, where virtually all amusements are closed, where any kind of disruption of the public order as severely understood by the Taliban it leads to execution. These are not the ways I want to live, and I doubt that they're the ways you want to live. I reject the whole premise of the question. That is that uh, there are many reasons and that we are somehow just a product of our environments and of our culture. And again, I, I think that the, the Muslims here in this room that, that have rejected that culture and, and that background because they have adopted reason. Um, reason is one thing. It is not different things to different people. Reality is one reality. You can you can see it, you can recognize it, you can identify it, or you can ignore it, reject it, turn your head away from it, rely on mystical revelation in its place. Reason is one. And the reason that I want to live in America and, 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 and not in, in, in the Middle East is because reason, rights, individual rights, and the political system of America is fundamentally pro-human life, pro-every human life. It's pro-European uh, life, it's pro-Muslim life, it's pro-every individual's life who is going to adopt reason and respect individual rights. It, there's no accident that immigrants to this country thrive. And it matters not what their ethnic background, it matters not what their cultural background was, at least historically, it matters not what even their religion was originally. They came to this country to the extent that they adopted the ideas at the core of this country. They succeeded and they thrived because reason, freedom, individual rights are pro-life. Sharia, or for that matter, Christian law in the Middle Ages are anti-life, anti-human life. They're bad for Muslims, they're bad for Jews, they're bad for Christians, particularly Jews and Christians. But they're bad for every human being qua as a human being. And that's why I reject it. I reject it because there is such a thing as a universal truth. There is such a thing as universal good. And it ain't in any kind of religious law. It's in religion. It's in the requirements. It's in religion. It's in reason. It's in the requirements of human survival. It's in the requirements of human life. What does it take to live, prosper, and succeed? And what it, that takes is reason and freedom. Freedom as expressed in the founding documents of this country and in the, in the concept of individual rights of which freedom of speech is one of those.
Thank you. This is for Dr. Pipes. You were accused by the Arab media of being responsible for starting the whole Danish cartoon idea. <laughs> Could you talk about that, please? Yes, I was. It began on February 6th when a far leftist American writer um, noted that Fleming Rose, the editor who commissioned these cartoons, had a year before those cartoons visited me in my office on October 9, 2004 and had done an interview with me, which came out a few days later in Hulens Posten. And this uh, wacko leftist writer, conspiracy theorist, came to the conclusion, uh-huh, well, it's obvious that if Rose came to my office to interview me and produced this interview in Hulens Posten, which I put up on my website in Danish, then uh, clearly I gave him the idea. Um, let me state for the record, this is nonsense. He came and did a journalist's interview with me and wrote it up. And if it's subsequently been translated to English and it's on my website, and it's a standard interview giving my thoughts on radical Islam. But what I found so interesting about this was twofold. One, that by and large, the media did not pick up on this idea that I instructed Fleming Rose, but rather softened it to say that Fleming Rose is an admirer of mine, a disciple of mine, uh, or so forth. Not that I actually told him to do it, but which again is nonsense. I, he's no disciple. We met for half an hour and he interviewed me. And secondly, it shows the bankruptcy of thought on the far left and among the Islamists that they would pick up on such a conspiracy theory. This notion circulated in websites. It made it into some respectable publications. In Belgium, for example, the weekly, the sort of t equivalent of Time magazine called Knock, uh, published this. In Jordan, a major, week, uh, major daily had it, and so forth. I have to admit, I had a fitful night when this first uh, came out. I thought, oh my god, do, you know, I am now being brought into this. But I'm happy to say two months later that it was just a kind of side phenomenon, a way of identifying Fleming Rose. Um, let me reiterate, I had nothing to do with his decision. I had no knowledge that he was going to commission these uh, cartoons. Uh, this was something I learned about in the media as the rest of you. Okay, gentlemen. Um, I, have, I have a slightly less inflammatory question. Uh, in regard to an example brought up earlier by, I believe it was Dr. Brook, uh, you mentioned that the American Declaration of Independence was also similarly a blatantly offensive uh, piece of legislation directed towards the British government. Um, however, at the same time, the American Declaration of Independence also emphasized the necessity for a decent respect for the opinions of mankind. Now, it seems clear to me that uh, such a respect, when it can differ to the extremities among uh, several members of the international community, do you believe that uh, one set internationally accepted definition of respect can be achieved? <laughs> I'm going to try and figure out what the question is. So, yes, I, I, and I think the standard needs to be nonviolent. That is, I have no problem with uh, Muslims all around the world writing letters to the editor, to European newspapers, condemning the cartoons, telling them that they think it's offensive, telling them that they're ridiculous that Islam is not this way. Muslims could have written essays, they could have written books, they could have written... And, you know, I think the Danish newspaper, my guess would be that they would have published those letters, uh, as would have most European letters, and that is what is meant by respect. That is, you know, a, a, an, an exchange of ideas. Now, again, if those ideas are so off the ball and ridiculous and laughable, you don't, there's no obligation, certainly, to publish other people's opinions. And if those ideas are clearly inciting violence, then you don't have to, or, inciting, or, or inflaming violence, you don't have to publish them, and indeed you shouldn't publish them. So the standard is, again, the standard is reason. The standard is, if you object to what I've said, you know, if, you, if, you, if there's a form to tell me, to write to me, to, you know, express your objection. Use words, use ideas, use reason to challenge what I have to say. But <coughs> notice that that's not what happened. And indeed, that's not what happens. Um, instead of dealing with ideas, instead of dealing with reason, instead of writing, instead of challenging, violence broke out because there is no ideological 
come back. Um, it, it is, this is a faith that wants to, at least elements within it, would like to expand it through the use of violence. And, and that's the way they express their views. I differ slightly. I differ, I differ slightly in that you have um, given really two alternatives, writing a letter to the editor and beheading. And I would note that there is a third way, a middle way, which is, for example, an economic boycott of Denmark, which is neither as innocuous as one or as, or as um, abhorrent as the other. And it is indeed, I would argue, in the long run, not terrorism, not violence as such, that promotes the radical Islamic agenda, but it is such actions as a boycott of a small country, a country about a third the size of the greater Los Angeles area in terms of population. It is the, uh, in, the um, intimidation, the intellectual intimidation that takes place. It is the economic intimidation. It is the forceful pushing of this ideology in a nonviolent way that is ultimately more dangerous than the violent action. So while not disputing the uh, total inadmissibility of the violence, I would say don't only focus on violence. That's not the only problem. Okay, next question. Um, in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful, I praise God and may the prayers of God be on his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What I'd like to say is I personally cannot sit here and take these two individuals seriously when they come and tell me that it is okay to sit here and offend people. You have right? to have a question. This is not a speech. I'm, com I'm coming to my question. I'm coming to a question. What I'd like to say is that when they come and tell me that it's okay, it's not okay for it's okay to go ahead and offend people, then I obviously question what comes out of their mouths. And Everyone knows that it does not take morality to question, to know that offending people is wrong. Your fifth grade teacher teach, taught you that in elementary school. What I'd, what I'd like to also add is that um, when you want to learn about Islam, you don't go to people that incite hate, such as these two men. When you, want to, when you learn about the African Americans, what is your you don't question? go to, question. I'm what asking my question. question. I'm coming what? to my question. What is your question? question? I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it. When you want to learn about African Americans, you don't go to the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. When you want to learn about the Nazis, the, Jew, the Jews, you don't go to the Nazis. So what, I, what I'd like to say and encourage everyone here is that when you want to, want to learn about Islam, go to a Muslim, go to a mosque in your own community, not to these two men, okay? My question is, okay, my question is, tell me, everyone get this and listen. Islam is the fastest growing religion, not only in the world, in the United States itself. Okay, so how do you reconcile everything that you're saying with the fact that 1.3 billion people, the second largest religion in this world, is Islam? Uh, okay. What I found so interesting about your little lecture is that you started by Please saying speak. there must be no offense, and then it seemed to me that you were offending me. You were pretty offensive to me, weren't you? What gives you the right to offend, and yet not these cartoonists? Why? Because you have a superior ideology that you may offend, and they may not? Point two about the fascist religion. That is nonsense. Nonsense. Everyone Islam is it's not fa the fastest. Everyone knows that. Excuse me. Everyone does not know it. I, for one, do not know it. Christianity is by far said. the largest and largest and fastest growing religion in this world. And if you don't know that, you're not paying attention to facts on the ground. Then obviously you're not paying attention either. <laughs> yeah, let me, yeah let me just say, <laughs> I, I think Dr. Pipes made a great point. Uh, when the other side wants to offend, they go hand and offend. Uh, and indeed, they burn down whole embassies, never mind offend. Uh, they kill people, uh, never mind offend. They have some kind of a right to do that. But we stand up here and say, you have a right to ask this question. Indeed, you have a right to offend uh, me and Dr. Pipes, not so much in this forum, uh, because we purchased it, but uh, you know, in your own forum, absolutely. Um, we're defending your right to speak, and, and you're coming out and, and offending us. And, and, and absolutely, the numbers are that the Catholic religion is indeed the fastest growing religion both in Asia and in South America. Not that I advocate for that either. You know, I think you've heard my opinion on religion in general. 
Uh, I would love to see atheism as being the fastest <laughs> growing. And I work long days to try and make that happen. Okay. Uh, back to written questions. Here's a historical question for Dr. Pipes. You stated freedom of speech did not exist in the Muslim world. Uh, it was, did not. The Muslim governance of Spain is an example in which this was not the case. In fact, philosophers and people of all faiths were allowed freely to practice such as uh, the Jewish and specifically mentioned uh, Averroes. Do you believe that such a government denied freedom of speech? And what about Muslim countries such as Iraq and Syria pre-1900? What are then the origins of Sephardic Jews and where did they live if not in these countries? Let me make clear that by, let me reiterate that by freedom of speech, I was talking about the freedom to insult one's rulers and insult Islam. In none of these places and times was that available. What there was available, particularly in medieval Islam, and indeed I wrote my uh, undergraduate thesis on this topic, was the freedom to explore rationality and explore specifically the implications of Greek thought. Averroes is such a figure. He and other philosopha, philosophers as known in Arabic, attempted to reconcile the rational thinking of the Greeks with Islam. And this attempt proceeded for several centuries until in roughly the 13th century it was basically closed down and has not taken place in a systematic way since then. But my point was about the freedom to insult leaders and the religion. That did not exist. I, let me just add to that because I, I think it's important to a point I made earlier. And, and that is that Islam thrived as a culture uh, in, in both uh, the Photo Crescent and, and later in Spain for exactly the reason that Dr. Pipes mentioned. That is the introduction into that culture of Greek ideas of rationality and reason. And indeed, it, it flourished during that was, its, in my view, its cultural peak. And it was the rejection of uh, Greece that, that followed the 13th century that has resulted in the decline in the Muslim world since then. And indeed, during that period, where was the West? The West was in a dark ages dominated by horrific uh, Christian theocracy. And it's only with the introduction through Aquinas of Greek thought into the West, of, of, uh, of Aristotle, of reason, into the West that led directly to the Renaissance and ultimately to Enlightenment. And our, to our benefit, we didn't abandon those Greek ideas, or at least haven't yet in a major way, although uh, most of our professors and most of our universities are attempting to in mass today uh, to, to abandon that heritage of reason and rationality. Uh, so th that, is, that is what makes great culture and great civilizations, reason, rational thought. Okay, one more. Um, dozens of passages in the Quran call for the killing of infidels. Does this constitute an incitement to violence? Should the Quran be protected under freedom of speech? There was, a, there was an interesting court case in Calcutta about 20 years ago where a group of Hindu plaintiffs uh, made this point and said the Quran should be banned given Indian strictures against hate literature. Needless to say, the court did not approve that. Um, but this is a recurring theme. There are, uh, just in Norway a couple of years ago, the um, call went out that the Quran, given its offensive qualities, how it does not, I mean offensive in the sense that uh, calling for the death of people uh, does not meet the uh, requirements of Norwegian law that it should be banned. Uh, uh, Clearly, this is not going to happen. And I'd note that the Bible has some pretty violent parts of it, too. The key is not the contents of the book. The key is what is made of those contents. And I think it's fair to say that with the rarest of exception, Jews and Christians do not go back to the violent parts of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and turn them into a program for action. That is, however, the case in Islam. So while 
I would in no way um, encourage the banning of the Quran. I would encourage, and I think we have to do everything possible to encourage an understanding of the Quran that moves beyond those violent passages, uh, reinterprets. There's a lot of fluidity in understanding a sacred scripture like the Quran and turns it into a modern, moderate, and good neighborly basis uh, in a way that it is not at this moment. And I'm optimistic that that will happen. There is no reason to expect that the hideous phenomenon of radical Islam, which is so powerful today, will be powerful uh, in the distant future as well. Okay, question. I would like to preface by saying that no one in this room is supporting radical violent Islam or supporting violence and, and burning of buildings in response to cartoons. So I feel that that's not the point here. But you seem to be arguing that Islam and the East is a threat to freedom and that the West or America should, uh, should and is best suited to fight that threat. But then is it not counterproductive for the United States to be combating these supposed threats to freedom with the Patriot Act, illegal wiretapping, extended detention in Guantanamo Bay, and other such policies that restrict the freedoms of not only foreigners, but also citizens of the United States, and therefore are being as much, if not more, of a threat to the freedom of speech and other such freedoms? Let me start by asking you how you know that no one in this room supports violent Islam. <laughs> Can I ask? Uh, can who, I can I ask as a who, question? Who does anyone in this room support well, well, radical, violent Islam? You you, no. you you didn't ask the question. You I just did. Well, I just did. You started by asserting it. I would not take that for granted if I were you, and I still don't take it for granted. If someone supported it, um, would they not stand up and say so right now? Oh please! <laughs> How innocent are you? Okay, go ahead. Please answer. Please answer my question. On other your um, point about civil uh, liberties and freedom the of speech. freedom of speech and the like. Look, any time during war, whether it be Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I, World War II, and other wars, there have been limitations placed on civil liberties. This is what happens in time of war. Uh, it is what's happening today. Uh, I don't care for the... Inf uh, infractions on civil liberties any more than you do. But I think what I see that you don't see is it's necessary for our common defense. I don't like to be specific going through airport security. I don't care for it. I suppose you don't care for it. I don't know anyone who enjoys standing in line and semi-stripping and all that, taking the shoes off. You know, Nobody likes it, but we accept it as part of the deal that we are safer on that plane for doing that. And writ large, all the examples you give, some of them wrongly done, but all of them are in the effort to assure our safety and therefore are legitimate. I, I fundamentally agree with that. My, my concern w with the Patriot Act and, and all these other things is that this is a, that this administration has not defined the war in a way that's winnable. Uh, I would like to see a horizon, a point in which these go away, because we've won the war. Um, and I would like to see articulated a strategy for victory versus a strategy for, uh, you know, for decades-long war, as, as, as President Bush and other politicians have described it. I don't think this needs to be a decades-long war, should be a decades-long war, uh, if we had a strategy to actually win it. And I would have liked to see Congress actually declare war. Uh, that would have given this also some finality in terms of these restrictions. I, I, I have a little bit more unease about the federal government taking on these, um, these uh, violations of, of, of some of our uh, rights without a sunset uh, with the idea that, um, and the federal government tends to, unless there is a clear cut sunset, tends to keep this going. Uh, you know, the RICO Act comes to mind, which was just going to be about the mafia, and then, of course, turned into every businessman today is being prosecuted under RICO. So that is my worry. But if, if a war is declared, if, if we are at war, and I think we are at war, then certain emergency measures have to be taken in order to secure Americans for the duration of the war, and they need to be, we need to do away with them when the war is over. Uh, I would advocate for the America to win this war and win it quickly. So we can go back to the kind of America you want. Next. 
Next question. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question that's sort of long, but hopefully not too long. Um, why choose to respond to radical elements in the Muslim world who are the source of force and, and intimidation that we both despise, Jew, atheist, Muslim, Christian, whatever, um, by defending these cartoons as the banner of freedom of speech? These cartoons in the closest to every Muslim's heart. Um, it's someone that Muslims love intimately and whose way of life they gratefully follow. Um, it's, act, it's acts like these that confuse the Muslim world as to the definition of various freedoms. Um, it's hard enough to advocate for freedom in the Muslim world when the word freedom is used to justify entire wars, wars in the Muslim world. When I see that picture over there, um, I, which says freedom go to hell, I see the resulting confusion that's caused by people with power with an inability to respect the people they want to convince about their ideas. So why defend these cartoons in this way? My main, my main argument in the introduction was that there needs to be an assertion that we are not living under Shari. We're not living under the Sharia. Uh, that the cartoons which are offensive to you and the cartoons which are offensive to me have a right to be published without you or me engaging in efforts to suppress them, be they violent or nonviolent. I do not believe that the United States or Denmark, for that matter, uh, but specifically the United States, should adapt Shari constraints. I don't believe that we should live according to that. And I will fight living under the Sharia. And this is my symbol of it. Had there been no pressure to suppress it, we would never have known about some of obscure cartoons in a Danish daily. It's only because of the efforts to suppress it. And when there are efforts to suppress it, I say no. Can I ask a quick follow-up question, or should I come back? Just one, just one. There's a long line. If you look behind you, there's a long okay. line. Just, just two comments. One is, why were these cartoons published in the first place? Why, why did the Danish uh, uh, newspaper even commission these cartoons and publish them? And it was to show what the, the fact that there was already so much self-censorship going on in Europe. It was to show that Sharia, in effect, was already impacting much of European society, where people were not willing to criticize Islam openly, where people were not willing to draw pictures of Muhammad for a children's book, where people were so intimidated that they were silenced. And the Danish, the, the Danish newspaper wanted to do show that, to make that real to, to, to Europeans. And indeed, they made it more real than even they thought that they would, because I don't think they anticipated the extent of the violence uh, that it could. Let me also say this. You're not going to teach the Muslim world about freedom, you know, this big debate going on within the Muslim world outside. You're not going to teach the Muslim world about freedom by relinquishing it. That is by compromising on it. It is important that when the debate about freedom occurs, that it be understood what freedom means. And freedom means the right to offend. And, and that the appropriate response to being offended is to ignore or to, or to debate uh, or to try to reason with, with the other person. Uh, so that is a, you know, if, if you, what you're concerned with is the message that the Muslim world gets from this, then I think it's a really important message that the Muslim world get that people who believe in freedom won't compromise that freedom. It's such an important value to us. It's so inherent in, in our lives. It's so fundamental to the, our way of life that we're not willing to give it up. And, and, and hopefully that will inspire them. And alternatively, it might cause them to think twice about rioting again. Okay, I'll come back to it. I just want to say that I think what you believe is defending freedom by not um, falling back because of these um, the responses from Muslim communities in Europe, I think that is not necessarily standing up for freedom, but it's, it's, it's giving the wrong message to the Muslim world by saying, like, you're, okay, no you're willing to insult okay. rather than listen. But anyway. Given that certain Muslims 
have made mistakes in judgment politically, do you feel it unfair to slander the symbol of all of what is good in religion? Well, we ourselves have not slandered. We are asserting the right of others, in this case the cartoonists, to live uh, as Westerners and make fun of religious leaders, political leaders, races, you name it. All the sensitivities are out there. There, there are no taboos. Name me a taboo in this society, something that we may not talk about. Every last one has been broken, and this one must be broken too. Yes, and, and you know, I don't know what, what, exactly what the question meant, but if you meant what gives you the right or, or why would you um, attack religion in any way, well, because I think it's wrong, and, and I have a right to my opinion, and not only that, I, I think it's detrimental, I think it's not good for the people who hold it, I don't think it's good for society, I don't think religion is good for anybody, again, whether it's Islamic religion, Christian religion, any religion, uh, and... and we live it. We live in a country where I am free to say that. To you know, some of you might be insulted by me saying that. Whether you're Christians, Jews, uh, you know, or um, you know, a lot of Jews don't like me because. I say that. Uh, but that's what freedom means. That that's what living in a country where I can say what I want to say about religion, uh, and you can say what you want about religion. And uh, you know, I I think I'm right, and I think you'd benefit from listening to what I have to say. But you can walk away. You can not read our website, uh, you know, AynRand.org. You can, <laughs> you can walk out. Uh, that is the beauty of freedom. And, and, and again, offending somebody, insulting somebody is not just some sideline of, of, of what freedom means. Freedom means that you have a right to do whatever you want to do as long as you don't violate other people's rights. That's what freedom means, including speech. But, you know, I probably do in my personal life stuff that might offend some of you. But that's none of your business. Okay. You know? One more question, um, written question. Why do Mr. Pipes and Mr. Brook have such a double standard in their plea for freedom of speech in the media? They insist that Islam must be criticized for the media to show their freedom. However, they make no mention of how mainstream media is on a leash when it comes to Israel. Any explicit criticism of racist Israeli policies or Israeli military crimes is immediately labeled anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish and is shut down. The obvious avoidance of the American media on the issue of Israeli military crimes is unacceptable. To, to, reiter to reiterate points that we've made before, freedom of speech means the freedom to say what you wish. It does not guarantee you an op-ed in a leading newspaper. Yeah, I don't know where to start, but but I, I think I think that is the key. Newspapers have a right to do to write what they want. I happen to think I personally happen to think that American newspapers tend to be quite anti-Israeli and and not pro-Israel enough. Um, and 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 that they they tend to be pro-Palestinian and 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 tend to and tend to overemphasize overemphasize those things that would be perceived as negative when Israel goes out and tries to defend itself against horrific violence. Uh, so, uh, you know, the whole premise of the question is wrong, but indeed, newspapers in the United States can publish what they want. If you want to write an op-ed uh, advocating for a different position, you have a right to do so. You have a right to start your own newspaper. Uh, you have a right to try to sell it and take any positions you want in that newspaper. But there is such a thing as, um, you know, facts, truth, and, and, and uh, the facts and the truth are not uh, consistent with your claims about Israel. Question. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I think there's no more thing, uh, there's no statement made in this uh, entire discussion that I could agree with more than what uh, Dr. Pipes said. 
that what is fundamentally at issue here is not a clash of civilization, is not a clash between ignorant, radical Muslims or ed and educated intellectual Westerners. It's basically a lack of understanding. It's fundamentally that and that only. So my question essentially leads uh, from this, and I hope you will allow a small two-part one. Uh, so what I, what I was hoping to hear today was a rational position from those who find the protest to these cartoons offensive. It's not about the violence. Violence, as just a previous questioner pointed out, is not something that anybody here, at least, is, is advocating. It was essentially what Doc, uh, Dr. Pipes just said, that you are opposed to the very uh, protest or the very concept that people would not take this as a valid criticism. What, what you are missing here, sir, is you not the fact that we're not, not sorry, speech, uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not the criticism. You have criticized and many others have criticized. It's slander that Muslims find offensive. And I would like to ask that when you come across these type of issues, for instance, I came here to learn from you what your position was. Where did you go? Which Muslim scholar or academician did you go to to understand what Muslims' position on this was? And why was it that they considered this radically different from the other criticism on Islam and Muslims that have come across? I have no argument against the, I'm not arguing with you that Muslims see this as slander. Uh, that this is a particularly delicate subject. I'm perfectly aware of that. What I am saying is that in the context of this country, there are no taboos. Everyone gets slandered in some publication or other, and that Muslims do not have the right to be privileged and to exclude criticism of themselves, their actions, or their profit. If everyone else had that right, then Muslims would have that right. My basic position is, not going beyond the cartoon issue, is that Muslims have the same rights as others. They do not have special rights. So if a government is in the habit of making land available at low prices to churches, synagogues, Hindu temples, and whatnot, then absolutely Muslims have a right to the same privilege. Uh, of subvention or some other sort. Whether or not I think it's a good idea is another story, but the, the right is there. Should no other group get such a privilege, then Muslims must not get it either. So, for example, I took offense on learning a few days ago that the Canadian Foreign Ministry has started a Muslim or a group within the Foreign Ministry. Uh, there is no other such religious group within the foreign ministry. I took offense when uh, I can go on and on because there are all these special privileges that Muslims are demanding in the West, whether it be municipal swimming pools that allow women only bathing at certain hours. Municipal, not private. Private's fine. Municipal is not fine. Or such issues as the land or such issues as being privileged by not having the same criticism that other religious figures directed at their religious figures. I'm saying no to special treatment, no to privileging. Same rights as everyone else, not special rights. I don't think, I'm sorry, I don't think uh, Dr. Pike's answer, I mean, his answer was very valid, but it was not to the question that I posed. My question was that where do you go to to understand the Muslim perspective? I, I'm sorry. I'm you, had sorry. Several you had several questions. No, uh, well, there me, was only one with the question right, mark at the end. A particular one, but, I, but I'd like to answer the comment. Answer the question. I want to answer, I'm going to answer the, the comment that you made, and that is that all that's involved here is a lack of understanding, because if all that was involved here was a lack of understanding, then your question were legitimate. Then, you know, then I should go and, and, and research and, and figure out what's really behind that. But when people fly airplanes into buildings, but people did fly airplanes into buildings, you can say you don't advocate for that. Did people burn down embassies in, in, in Beirut? People did burn down embassies in Beirut. Uh, are people inciting violence against the West? Are people insisting on Sharia law in the West? Yes, that is who we perceive as the enemy. That is who the enemy is. That is who we are fighting against. So I don't need to go and understand Islam when I see somebody running at me with a knife, I need to shoot him. That's it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, 
Okay, so my question is, how do you reconcile the fact that you said that force is the, th is the problem, uh, force is the problem in, in, in freedom of speech and so on and so forth, like you can have freedom of speech without, with discourse and so on, with the war in Iraq, which is killing hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, under the evolving pretext, which is currently, it's changing all the time, but it's currently liberation or freedom, how can you impose that f by force, which is U.S. is doing with causing hundreds of thousands of deaths, which like pales in comparison to the deaths caused on the other side. And second, the U.S.'s support for uh, oppressive, tyrannical regimes in funding like Egypt, uh, Jordan, and namely, primarily Israel. Um, well, let, let, me, let me start by saying that I am no fan of American foreign policy in the present, or certainly not in the past. Um, I was a, a critic of the war in Iraq. I, I did not think it was the right war, uh, at the, you know, uh, the right thing to do at the time. I thought there were more pressing things that need to be done in the war, uh, in, in the war on uh, radical Islam. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, you know, on Islamic totalitarianism, on this ideology. Um, but uh, given that, uh, given who Saddam Hussein was, uh, given his um, animosity to, you know, his, his, his threats towards the United States, given his attempt to murder a, a United States president, um, given everything that he's done, it, he was, I'll use the term again, fair game for the United States uh, to eliminate him, to get rid of him. He was a threat to the United States, I think a minor threat relative to other countries in the Middle East, but a threat nevertheless, and it was completely legitimate for us to get rid of him. Now, I disagree with the way the war is being handled. I disagree with the idea of us staying there and bringing so-called, you know, freedom. I don't, I don't believe this administration knows coherently what freedom means, uh, but but I, I certainly don't think that it is it, that it is appropriate in a war of self-defense in the context of the Middle East to try to force that. I would have liked to see us, if we were going to go to war in Iraq, go in, uh, you know, destroy what we thought was a threat. The the the. Uh, you know, Hussein regime and get out of there and get on to the business of what is necessary to win this war. And that is identify uh, Islamic totalitarian regimes and, and, uh, and organizations and go after any regime that, that actively supports that. I happen to, I, I think that the number one regime that supports that kind of terrorism, the number one regime that advocates for it in its media, in its uh, sermons on, on Fridays and, and through its president is Iran. Uh, and I think that should have been the target from day one. But, uh, you know, we are at war. Uh, we are at war here. And to evade the fact that we are at war, look, we killed more Germans than the Germans killed Americans when we went to war against Germany. Germany started a war against us, and we killed many, many, many more Germans in winning the war. If you go to war, you need to go to win it. And, and you need to do whatever's necessary to win that war. I find your question about Iraq astonishing because you seem to be asking it from the point of view of Iraqi interests, Iraqi welfare. And yet, the clear implication of your question is the Iraqis would be better off under Saddam Hussein. Some humanitarian you are. Can you, can you answer the question? You don't just imply, think, I didn't ask you to interpret my thoughts. I, I would go to a mind reader for that. Can you answer the question? I did. You didn't answer the question. <laughs> next. I, th I think we'll go to the next he one. He insulted me. Next. Can you question. answer the question, please? You asked, a, you asked two questions. He answered one. I dealt with another. Uh, we're no, not going to get into American foreign policy in Egypt and Jordan and Israel. This is not our topic tonight. Next question. Uh, first of all, let's talk. Let's meet again some other time and talk about U.S. policy in the in the Middle East. <laughs> That's not our topic tonight. There is more violence in Iraq right now than it was in Saddam. I hate Saddam. I don't like him. But there is more violence and killing in Iraq happening there more than 13 years ago. A girl would walk to her school without being raped 15 years ago. But right now, it's more it's easier to uh, for that to happen. That's number one. Number two is. Uh, the usage of the term anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, no, I, I have to give a couple of facts. 
and then I'll give a question, please. A short, short, uh, short comments. Uh, anti Islam, some people say that Islam is anti-Semitic, but the, that's very uneducated because Quran, which is in Arabic, is a Semite language. Yeah. So this is very historically uneducated mistake. Uh, number three, uh, some people, uh, the uh, Mr. Dr. Yaron here said that he would support, encourage even atheism. We, we have seen what atheism have done to the world, like the Soviet Union and the violence it has caused. So please don't encourage uh, atheism. Uh, number, no, uh, I, the, I think, the, the, I the question is, is, a, is a, 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 the question is on my, is coming, okay? You've already had two. No. Did I don't, just, I'll, I'll give you the question. Okay, you've had two. No, no, I'll give you one. I'll give you the question. I'll give you a question. No, You've me. already had two. You've had two questions. No, no, I, we'll I didn't give a question. I, I just, I just highlighted some okay. mistakes that you guys have done. Those that I've said. You're, you're Those no, are no, both no, questions. No, you no, no. For, okay, okay. I'll give you my question. I'll give you my question. No, I have to give you my question. You're off the air. No, no, I have to give you my question. I'll have to ask you to leave. Is this free of speech? Do you think this is free of speech? Okay. Go ahead and answer. Okay, uh, you, I'll answer two of your points. The first one about how there's so many more deaths in Iraq today again points to the fact that you wish that Saddam Hussein was still there. I find this just amazing, that you think that Iraq would be better off with Saddam Hussein still in power. As far as anti-Semitism in the Quran, I don't know that anyone brought that issue up, but the notion that because the Quran was written in a Semitic language, it can't be anti-Jewish, it's very because the Quran was written in Arabic, it can't be anti-Jewish. Is a very v let me let me give you a brief a brief education in the term semite, semite and anti-Semite. The term Semite is a pseudo scientific term that was developed in the 19th century to group together a number of languages. I shouldn't say pseudo scientific. It was it was a valid term to group together a number of languages, including Hebrew and Arabic, but many others as well. In, the, uh, in 1889, a, a, an Austrian anti-Jewish anti writer by the name of Wilhelm Marr came up with the term anti-Semite. This was pseudo-scientific, the notion that there's a Semitic race, and he's against the Semitic race. This term, although very inaccurate, has become standard in many Western languages, including English. It's not a good term. Anti-Jewish is the term. It's what one refers to. It's not talking about Semites in general. It's talking about Jews. That's what the term only means. Now, the fact that Ar the Quran is in the Arabic language and Jews speak or have historically spoken a language related to Arabic is utterly, utterly irrelevant. Furthermore, no one actually said that the Quran is anti-Semitic. I don't remember hearing that. Uh, well, the, the Quran has many elements in it, some of which are quite friendly to the Jews, dating from the period when Muhammad was trying to win Jewish support, and then some quite negative towards the Jews at a time when Muhammad was negative towards Jews and fighting Jews. So you can find, as I mentioned before, many things in a sacred document, and they can be interpreted in many ways. But this was not an issue that we raised here. Yeah, let me just address two of the comments you made. One is, if you want to blame anybody for the, for the violence and the, the killing in Iraq right now, blame the Shiite militias and the insurgents. They're the one inflicting the violence. If, if, the Iraqis, if the Iraqis valued and wanted freedom, they would have embraced the American troops and they would have, uh, they would have established a free country in Iraq. They are the ones killing each other. The hundreds of thousands of deaths, if those numbers are even accurate, are primarily uh, a sectarian civil war between uh, Shiites and Sunnis going on right now that, uh, that if the America left, would, would continue and actually intensify and get worse. Um, but uh, to accuse atheism of, of uh, the horrors of communism and, uh, and fascism is, is absurd. Uh, first of all, the fascists were certainly not atheists. They, they, they strongly advocated for religion and were pro-religion and were very pro-faith uh, as if you read uh, Goebbels or Hitler or any of these, they, they, they claimed to be Christian and they, they were very proud of faith qua faith. They had direct communication with someone. The communists replaced faith in God with faith in something else, in the proletarian. But it was still essentially faith. It was still essentially a religion. And it was faith in a collective instead of faith in an unobservable, unknowable, un 
other entity. When I talk about atheism, particularly in the context of my emphasis over and over and over and over again about reason and rationality, I am talking about that reason and rationality as the guide to human life, as the only tool of cognition, as the only tool of knowledge, and as the only tool of decision making, of action. And that certainly the communists didn't advocate because they were very anti-reason, and certainly the fascists didn't advocate because they were very anti-reason. Read them. Marx is very anti-reason, and certainly the Hitlers of the world are very anti-reason. Uh, what I'm advocating is individualism, personal responsibility, not following a collective, not blindly uh, doing what some guru or leader or collective co so-called consciousness advocates, but doing what is in your own rational self-interest, what your reason dictates. And that has nothing to do with those horrific movements of the 20th century, and they are not atheistic movements. They are both religious movements of a different type than the classical religion that we're used to, but they're both still religious movements because they're based on the, f what is religion about? The essence of religion is faith, and the essence of faith is the rejection of reason because faith demands, the number one thing is it demands that you accept, that you accept without evidence. That is the essence. That is what faith means. Look it up in the dictionary. Okay, you're through. Okay, another uh, written question. You, you made no distinction between peaceful and radical Muslims. Do you see no distinction? Does all Muslim ideology as practiced by Muslims worldwide demand violence? I believe this was in fact answered. No, I, I think it's worth um, okay. answering. Um, I do draw a distinction between Islam, the religion, and radical Islam, the political ideology. Our enemy is radical Islam. It is a movement that is minoritarian, has perhaps 10, 15% of the Muslim world supporting it, wanting to have the Sharia imposed on it. Most Muslims do not. Uh, it is intolerant, intransigent, uh, highly ambitious to s take over countries as in Iran, Afghanistan, Sudan, and ultimately uh, many others, including this one. Uh, it has a cosmic, um, uh, has a set of, it, it seeks worldwide hegemony and sees itself in a cosmic battle with the West in general and the United States in particular. No, this is not about Islam, the religion. This is about a certain reading of Islam that has become very prominent and powerful in the past few decades. Okay, how do you feel about increasing conversion rates of Americans to Islam? Can we stop people from accepting Islam? <laughs> I have no feelings. People can convert to whatever religion they wish. I, I mean, I do have feelings, but I have the same feelings about people becoming evangelical. Uh, I worry about the radicalization of Islam in the United States and the fact that so many uh, you know, of, of the Muslims' organizations and, and, and Muslims in the United States have been influenced by these, uh, by these violent streams within uh, within uh, global Islam. But uh, if somebody is converting to just, you know, what is it? What would it be? Uh, uh, normal. <laughs> I don't know if there's such a thing. But uh, non-violence uh, and non-advocacy of Sharia, then we live in a free country and, and, and they can do that. Okay, we'll go back to uh, oral questions. Now, please do not precede your question with a speech. Just ask the question. Okay, I just want to say, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. I bear witness that Muhammad is the best man that ever lived and the best man I that will live to, to the end of the world. And my question is in regards to your claim that Islamic Sharia uh, advocates throwing your ideology against people with the sword. Now, if we look at history, we will see that the last hundred years, which have been ruled by Christian, Jewish, secular, atheist ideologies, has forced millions of people to die. Who was the one who dropped Hiroshima, Nagasaki? Who was the one that killed three million people in Vietnam? Who was the one that killed millions of people in Korea? Who are the ones who are occupying a country? I don't see 135,000 Iraqis or, or Saudis in America pushing Sharia law. Uh, who is the one that is uh, occupying a, a base in Guantanamo? Who has the I, one that has been I, occupying I got, people's... I, I got, we got, we got the question. Uh, the, the, We've got the, 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 the
You're finished now. America, first of all, let me say I already said, uh, you know, I'm not going to stand here and defend American foreign policy, so I'm not going to defend all the different wars you cited. Uh, dropping of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was an incredibly, dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was an act of moral heroism on the part of President Truman. It was an act, it was an, it was an act, it was an act of self-defense. It was an act that not only, that it was an act that saved hundreds of thousands of young American lives, uh, an act that saved millions of Japanese lives, not that I think it should have been dropped for that. Uh, it, 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 it was a her morally heroic act. Um, this country, America, is luckily not a Christian country. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the greatest country that has ever existed. It is the freest country. It is the freest country that has ever existed. It is, it is only because this country came into existence that anywhere in the world can you stand up and, and say that, and I can sit here and talk about it, because until America came into being, there was no free speech or individual rights anywhere in the world, um, and it is, it, all you have to look is at the fact. Uh, you look at, look at the surroundings, look at the freedom we have here, the prosperity we have here, the success that we have here, because our founding fathers created the first free, secular, secular, not Christian, secular country in the history of the world. Uh, that pr the first country in the history of the world to protect individual rights. And that is why we are so prosperous, so successful, so happy, and so open to debate, to these kind of discussions. Okay. Quick, quick two points. First, you said that Muhammad is the best man who ever lived. You did not say that he was perfect. And that's an important distinction. And it is a very Islamic distinction. Secondly, uh, your long listing of American misdeeds or alleged misdeeds reminds me of just a few weeks ago, I was at a conference at which one of the speakers gave a long listing of Islamic misdeeds going back to the very origins of Islam. One can always pick um, uh, atrocities or uh, the, the underside, but I think uh, neither giving a one-dimensional view of Islamic history or American history is terribly useful. Uh, the, uh, not everything Americans have done is to be proud of. Mis this, uh, great mistakes have been made. There's some really terrible things that have happened. The key is the full picture, not to isolate the, the, the wretched, the worst, but to look at the picture of a whole. The Muslim world as a whole over centuries and the United States over its two centuries. Uh, this otherwise is just cheap uh, demagoguery. It's important to look at the whole picture. Okay. All right, we have time for one final question. Uh, my Make question is regarding the, in this uh, forum, we have been uh, fighting for the freedom of speech. Uh, I would just uh, like to ask the thing that this, this thing has made a point that uh, if something is limited, restricted, it's no more free. So uh, you said that if some speech actually incites towards violence, is attributed towards violence, and that restricts, and that puts a limit to a free speech, does that kill the topic? The other point is that just to keep it to that one question, okay? Yeah, I mean, I'm, to take, I'm just taking the same we're question. Of, we're out of time. Yeah. So You're we're right. The, the, the same question when taken here. Mic, then. I have to, we're, we're literally out of time, otherwise I'd be happy to. Again, I made this distinction. If you are advocating for violence, if you're inciting violence, it's not just an academic discussion about a passage in... I don't know, the, the Old Testament that calls for violence. But it, you are literally saying to people, go and kill, go and behead. That is not speech. That is violence. It's the same as if I walk into a bank and, um, and say, uh, empty, you know, I've got a gun in my pocket. I'm, I'm not showing you the gun, right? It's right there. Uh, empty your vaults and give it to me. I, I just spoke. I didn't do anything. That is violence. 
It's not speech. I can't say, well, you have a right to say that you're robbing the bank. That is violence. Or if I sit around with my pals and scheme how to murder somebody or how to rob the bank, that is not speech. That is violence. So it's not a limit on speech. It's categorizing what speech, what is and isn't speech. And advoca the advocation of violence, just like the advocation of fraud, is not speech. It is violence, and therefore it is banned in a, civil, in a society that respects individual rights. That is my point. I hope. Thank you very much. Uh, I, there was a, a lot of disagreement in this audience, but I hope you've learned something. In America, this kind of debate can take place, and nobody gets killed. <laughs> this kind of forum is what America is all about. So please thank the two panelists very much, and thank you for coming. <laughs>